Novichok attacks have brought Britain and Russia to the brink of cyber war. The UK will take its case to the UN Security Council. Twitter and Facebook have completed their testimony on Capitol Hill, but investigation of tech's role in influence operations and public discourse continue. So do concerns about election security. Unpatched micro-tick routers are being exploited in the wild. An oil rig shows some new tricks. Now I'd like to share some words about our sponsor, FireEye. They're hosting their annual Cyber Defense Summit in Washington, D.C. from October 1st through October 4th. The first two days are devoted to introductory, intermediate, and advanced training. It's hands-on, small group, and interactive, and it's going to be conducted by some of the best in the business, FireEye's experienced cybersecurity experts. Check out the list of courses at summit.fireeye.com. But of course there's more, and you won't want to miss that either. The 64th U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine K. Albright, will be there to deliver the guest keynote. Her topic? Economy and security in the 21st century. And former Home Depot CEO Frank Blake will share what he learned from his company's 2014 data breach. Don't miss it. To learn more and to register, go to summit.fireeye.com. That's summit.fireeye.com. And we thank FireEye for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, September 6, 2018. The day's biggest story comes from the United Kingdom. We may be seeing something that amounts, almost, to declared cyber war between the UK and Russia. British Prime Minister May told Commons yesterday that the government had identified the attackers responsible for the Novichok nerve agent attacks. Those attacks were an attempted assassination of a former GRU officer, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter Yulia, back in March. Skripal had been living in the UK after being exchanged in a spy swap with Russia. He'd been working for British intelligence. Prime Minister May named Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Borshov, characterizing them as GRU operatives. She said the attacks were almost certainly approved at a high level. Other leading conservatives were equally direct. The chairman of the Commons Foreign Affairs Committee, Tom Tugendhat, said there's no doubt the attacks were state-ordered and President Putin bears responsibility for a warlike act. The Prime Minister said that The full range of tools from across our national security apparatus will be used against the GRU. That full range of tools is understood to encompass principally offensive cyber operations. The Prime Minister briefed U.S. President Trump Tuesday, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau yesterday, and has requested an emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council. Russia has consistently denied any involvement in the Novichok attacks, demanding to see the evidence and claiming that the incident is an Anglo-American provocation probably aided and abetted by the Czechs. Essentially, no one believes this, certainly not outside of Russia, and probably not within Russia either. The two GRU officers named, and whose names Russian President Putin's foreign policy advisor, Yuri Ushakov, told reporters, do not mean anything to me, will be prosecuted if British authorities can get their hands on them, and GRU-associated organizations will face a range of sanctions, but from what's being said in London, this won't be a simple matter of law enforcement or sanctions. The story is still developing, but active cyber-offensive operations against Russia by the UK and possibly the other four of the Five Eyes seem highly likely. The encryption debate continues, highlighted by recent reports of a memo from the Five Eyes Group, that's the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, demanding that service providers create customized solutions tailored to their individual system architectures that are capable of meeting lawful access requirements. Many read that as being a backdoor. Robert Anderson is a principal at the Chertoff Group and previously worked in the FBI. Now, I think my position on this, quite frankly, especially over the last three years since I've been in the private sector and left the FBI after I retired, it's changed. Um, You know, one of the reasons it has changed is because between running 
practices in the private sector that respond to cyber breaches of, you know, personal identifiable information, banking information, and a variety of other things. I think that the uh, tech companies that are producing different levels of encryption have a fiduciary responsibility to their clients to make sure that that can't be breached. Uh, I think when you do put in back doors, and I've seen it a lot in the several thousand breaches that I've run uh, for clients since I've left the FBI, um, it opens up risk to hundreds of thousands of people. So I think there really needs to be nowadays uh, a new dialogue that's kind of started at the federal and state level, especially the kind of leading technical companies around the United States to have a discussion on how can they help law enforcement obtain information that they may need either via warrant or other means uh, to protect this country, but at the same time, protecting the clients that have, you know, employed them or hired them to hold their data uh, secretly or in a secure manner. So can you take us through what would that dialogue uh, sound like? I think the first thing that you need to have a start is, is a common ground. There's a lot of information that, quite frankly, state, local, municipal law enforcement, and even some federal law enforcement organizations really don't know how to mine. There's a tremendous amount of open source data throughout the Internet and through apps that people put on their phones that can provide law enforcement with a lot of information. It can provide law enforcement with location of an individual, uh, where individuals like to frequently shop or go eat. There's a variety of things that without breaking the trust of the clients to keep their data secure, they can assist the law enforcement organization on learning how to mine that data. And whether it's mined through open sources or through a warrant, I think that's a huge step in the right direction. Do you think there is a, a legislative uh, solution to this? If, if you had a, well, I remember certain levels of encryption used to be categorized as munitions and it was, oh. a, you know, prohibited from being exported. Um, is that a, a path to pursue or is that going to lead us nowhere? Well, I think a couple things need to happen, right? One is that the federal government's IT infrastructure is lagging. It's way behind the private sector. And a lot of that is because the traditional rules and laws that are set in place to procure IT or any type of uh, really infrastructure, it takes a very long time. So between the bidding process, the multiple bidders, getting it funded, usually in the second or third fiscal year from when you started, by the time you have the IT infrastructure installed, it's already very much out of date when you're trying to keep up with the private sector. And whether that's defense contracting, banking, or you know any other type of private sector needs, historically, the private sector moves much faster. They don't have all those rules in place. So one thing is I think you need to level the playing fields, and I think the Congress and Senate can help on this. I think they can help the federal organizations that need updated IT modernization uh, to allow to procure and install that equipment much quicker and faster. That, in turn, will help these organizations actually communicate to private sector companies and organizations much quicker and, and on an equal basis. And I think that's a huge start to this. I think one of the other crucial things that tech giants can help with, and again, it stays clear of actually decrypting or opening back doors, but setting up training on digital uh, evidence collection that I can guarantee you that there may be parts of the federal or state law enforcement community may understand. But overall, you know, we have 70,000 police organizations across this country. When you go to most countries, they have one, maybe two, because it's a giant federal police force. It's a lot harder to make sure that everybody in the country that we live in actually have the ability to do these types of digital investigations. So I think that would be a huge help. And again, it doesn't break that barrier of encryption that the clients are expecting uh, from these companies. That's Robert Anderson from the Chertoff Group. Hearings on social media held yesterday by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence elicited from Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg her example of what might companies like hers be expected to do against foreign influence operations. Suspend inauthentic accounts, the way Facebook, Google, and Twitter did when FireEye tipped them to such accounts links to Iran's government. 
She said, quote, In our mind, that's the system working, end quote. But larger questions about disinfecting online nastiness remained unanswered, quite possibly because they're unanswerable. The U.S. Department of Justice announced that it will be looking at social media providers for signs of suppressing certain kinds of expression and for engaging in anti-competitive practices. We turn to notes on evolving threats that industry researchers have had their eyes on recently. Kihu 360 warns of multiple malware attacks spreading across vulnerable, unpatched micro-tick routers. They've identified more than 370,000 vulnerable devices. The vulnerability in question was patched in April, so this represents another case in which threat actors are exploiting known issues. Micro-tick routers are widely used and have been the subject of several waves of attack. One of the better-known earlier waves involved exploits WikiLeaks publicized in its Vault 7 leaks. Palo Alto Networks reports that Iranian threat actor Oil Rig has adopted a more evasive variant of the Oops IE Trojan. Oil Rig has been active against government targets in the Middle East for some time, against, to be specific, regional rivals of Iran. It's shown considerable resourcefulness in adapting commodity tools and adding useful functionality as it becomes available. It's now doing so with its incorporation of the Oops IE Trojan. This malware starts its execution by conducting multiple checks for virtualized environments and sandboxes. It checks such items as CPU fan information, a first for Oops IE, temperature, mouse pointer, hard disk, motherboard, time zone, and human interaction. In checking for time zone, it executes only if it finds itself in five specific time zones. Then the Trojan sleeps for two seconds, moves to the app data folder, and ensures persistence. How is oil rig spreading this ingenious payload? Through a familiar and well-proven method. Spear phishing. The Billington Cybersecurity Summit is running today in Washington, D.C., as it always does, the summit will feature leaders from government and industry sharing their perspectives on threats, risks, innovation, and investment. You'll find our live tweets from the conference in our Twitter timeline if you haven't seen them already, and we'll have more on the proceedings in upcoming issues of the CyberWire. I'd like to take a minute to tell you about an exciting CyberWire event. It's the fifth annual Women in Cybersecurity Reception. It's taking place October 18th at the International Spy Museum's new facility at L'Enfant Plaza in Washington, D.C. The Women in Cybersecurity Reception highlights and celebrates the value and successes of women in the cybersecurity industry. The focus of the event is networking, and it brings together leaders from the private sector, academia, and government from across the region, and women at various points in their careers. The reception also provides a forum for women seeking cybersecurity careers to connect with the technical and business professionals who are shaping the future of our industry. It's not a marketing event, it's just about creating connections. We're grateful to our sponsors. Here are some of them. Our hosting sponsor is Northrop Grumman. Our presenting sponsors are CenturyLink and Silence. Our platinum sponsor is Cooley. Gold sponsors include T. Rowe Price, VMware, Accenture Security, Observe it, Saul Ewing, Arnstein, and Lair, and Exelon. Tune in tomorrow. We'll share some more of our sponsors. And if your company is interested in supporting this important event, we still have a few sponsorship opportunities available. As it's been in previous years, this is an invitation-only event. We do it this way to ensure a mix of women with diverse backgrounds and at different career levels. If you're interested in getting an invitation to this year's event, tell us a little bit about yourself and request one at our website, thecyberwire.com slash WCS. That's thecyberwire.com slash WCS. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope to see you there. And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, and he's also my co-host on the Hacking Humans podcast, which if you are not listening to and subscribing to, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> so, Joe, welcome back. <laughs> Hi, Dave. So, interesting story came by. This was uh, written by Hilary Gregonis from Digital Trends. Uh -huh. And uh, this is a biometric scanner catches imposter at U.S. airport on just third day of use. Right. So, this is the Customs and Border Protection folks. Uh, what What's going on here? So, what's, what's happened 
somebody comes in and they present a Brazilian passport. Right. Something gets flagged, uh, and and the guy gets searched, and they find his actual passport, which is actually from the Congo, in his shoe. Mm. All right. So what has happened is this guy has tried to commit a crime. He has tried to come into the country illegally with with a falsified document. And so this, presumably the system scans his face. The, scans his face, the picture on his passport. Mm-hmm. I, I would guess that the way this works is the picture on the passport and the, the face that the human has are compared by uh, the agent sitting there right. at, at, at uh, CPB. If this guy's coming in with a fake passport with his picture on it, then it has to be the case that the U.S. government has access to the original picture. Right, from which, Brazil. From Brazil. The person whose name is on that Brazilian passport so we we must have we have some sort of sharing agreement right. at our borders right. with we those do. databases, which would make sense to me. Yeah, that there's some kind of information about that might just have passport numbers and names and pictures mm-hmm. in a database. Somewhere. Countries that are our allies. Now, so it's working as it should be designed, right? No problem. People, you know, potentially uh, people mm. up to no good coming into our business or into our country, rather. Uh, no problem here. Yeah, I, I don't know how <laughs> I feel about this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because I don't recall anything when I applied for my passport a number of years ago saying that my information would be distributed to foreign governments. Hmm. Um, and that is apparently what has happened. I mean, that's the kind of thing I can imagine being some part of some treaty, you know, Probably information, is. border protection, information exchange or something right. like that. That every country has to go through this. Right. So, I'm, you know, part of me says, you know, that I didn't know this was happening, but the other part of me goes, well, you should have had some kind of expectation of this happening. Yeah. It's it's almost a, a necessary thing to do in order to assure that every country can secure their borders, which is what every country wants to do. Now, do you feel differently about this if it was going on within the United States versus Very just much at, so. the, at the border? So if, if this, I'm yeah. flying domestically and they're checking my ID using some sort of biometric scanning thing, that, that uh, Actually, raises your hackles? or Yeah, with flying, n- not so much. I okay. mean, you could always take an alternative means of travel, I guess, but you know it still kind of irritates me. Yeah. The big, the big thing about this, all this security stuff, is it generally tends to be security theater, mm. right? Um, so everything we're doing, all this, all this liberty that we're sacrificing, is not netting us much. Hmm. That's my concern. You know, they they penetration test the system, mm-hmm. right? Their success rate at catching the weapons in these tests was ten percent. Hmm. They caught ten percent of the weapons that went on, which means ninety percent of the weapons. Pass through the security checkpoint, right? Um, which is not a good result. I don't. That was that's an old result. I don't know if they've impro- improved the process or anything. We certainly haven't heard anything about that. Well, recently. and on the other hand, how often do you hear about a plane being hijacked? So uh, maybe the security theater is, had, you know, made the bad guys move on to other methods. Right, and and they have moved on to other methods. Yeah, um, and bad guys are going to do bad things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just the way way the universe works. Uh, my, I would really, really, really have a problem with this, and and if this was something that law enforcement within the United States was doing, hmm. um, I would think that then we'd have some kind of uh, unreasonable search and seizure going on. Uh, but to enter to enter the border of a country, you know, it's kind of creepy. But I'm not sure I I I can I can get opposed to it. I can be opposed to it. All right. Well, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, these systems are up and running, and and here's an example of it uh, functioning the way it was intended, I suppose. Yep. All right. Well, as always, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, Dave. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all the stories mentioned in today's podcast, check out our daily news brief at thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silance can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit Silance.com. And Silance is not just a sponsor, we actually use their products to help protect our systems here at the CyberWire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace ONE Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Ivan, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.